Hi, this is Frank, and welcome back to The Next Realignment. In this episode, we are going to be talking about the crisis of the American Republic that created the versions of the Democratic and Republican parties that we still know today during the Great Depression and the New Deal. Over the next few episodes, we're going to be talking about the story that you absolutely have to understand if you want to understand our political era and what's happening to American politics right now. And that is the story of the New Deal, the fight over the policies of Franklin Roosevelt that started with the beginning of his presidency in 1932 and rose all the way up to the beginning of the Second World War. And that story, it's really important because it's an origin story, specifically it's the origin story of our political era and the parties that we now know, the versions of the Democrats and the Republicans that we've known throughout our lives. This was the time where not just the coalitions that we now know as Democrats and Republicans, and not just the ideas that have defined those parties for as long as we can remember, but the ideologies, the ideologies of New Deal liberalism and modern conservatism, this is when they came to be. This political framework by which we see all of politics it started right here under Franklin Roosevelt and the fight over its policies in the New Deal. We've now walked through all the other eras of American political history. And what we've seen is they were having different political fights. The parties weren't just containing different coalitions of people, but politics was framed around different issues and none of it was liberalism or conservatism. I mean, we had parties that were kind of liberal in certain ways and kind of conservative in other ways, and in some ways, just something that we can't even identify at all. I mean, you had parties like the Whigs, who were in some ways a lot of times called conservative because they were a pro-business party and they attracted a lot of economic elites and cultural elites. They were also a party of using the government to create reform, using the government to make people's lives better and spending and infrastructure. It's impossible to classify a party like that under the terms of which we view all politics today. Our party system, like everyone, is a party system. And that means, like every party system, it had a beginning. It had a moment where there was a big national crisis, where there was a new great debate that America needed to resolve. And it channeled those that debate into two new coalitions and parties and ideologies, and they started this debate. And then, like every party system, it had a middle, which has been our lives, where they had the debate over time. And then eventually, like every party system, it's going to have its eventual end. So if we want to understand what's happening to our parties now, we have to understand it in the context of every political party system as a party system. And that's the story that we're going to be telling today. The populist and progressive party debate, as we remember, was a debate about an industrializing country. You had a country that was an agricultural country with all these small towns. And uh, now we had these swelling cities and factories springing up and immigrants pouring in and new technologies and new millionaires, and it had disrupted everything. And we needed parties to debate how to handle that, what to do about that, what reforms were gonna be needed to deal with this transition. And we had populism and progressivism and these two new ideas and we created these two new parties. But by the end of the First World War, that debate was mostly done because America had emerged not as an industrializing country. It was now an industrialized country. It was now a country of cities. It was a country of factories. It was a country with motor cars and airplanes and electricity and telephones. And it had a much more complex economy. And it had emerged as a great power in this new modern world. And that was now the start of the Roaring Twenties. It was prosperous, things were going well, and all the problems that America had had to navigate as it was transitioning, now the transition was done. And most of the parties had implemented all their reforms. You know, things like the ending child labor and uh, getting a handle on maximum work hours and these new factories and new regulations and antitrust, it had all been done. So what did you see? Like in every party system, it started to decline. The progressive movement, which had been this big engine of moral reform that had been blazing across the country, it started now to kind of peter out, didn't really have an agenda. The Third Great Awakening, the religious revival that had fueled 
a lot of that moral reform, it too started to cool. People started to get more pragmatic again, enjoying the good times at the wake of the war. And uh, they started turning away from moral reform and to the church to more sort of practical concerns. And politics naturally, again, went into a drift, which it always does in times like these, because the parties, they were organized around debates that were resolved. and They now didn't really have anything practically to do. So they kind of did nothing. You also saw, which you often see in these times, a new uh, sort of burst of corruption. Things like the presidency of Warren Harding, one of the most sort of incompetent and uninterested presidents we've ever had, had an incompetent government with scandal after scandal after scandal. And America didn't really care, though, because things were going well. The country was rich. We had flappers and gin joints, and we were dancing the Charleston, and everything was looking up. And then finally, in 1929, the stock market crashed, and it all came to an end. From where we stand today, it can be sometimes hard to appreciate the horrificness of the Great Depression and what a monumental and horrific event it truly was. And that's because it wasn't just an economic recession like we're used to. It was something much, much bigger. It was the worst economic catastrophe this country has ever faced. I mean, unemployment uh, reached almost 25%. One out of four people could not find work at all. Uh, national industrial production, it dropped by about half. And people, they lost their homes. They started forming shanty towns to have a place to live. So they'd become essentially refugee camps of Americans in their own country. People couldn't get enough to eat, so they were going to soup kitchens reliant on, on that uh, charity just to survive. And the thing about it that it's hard for us to appreciate now, when you look at these pictures, and you see the black and white photos of people in the Depression, and they look miserable and gaunt. But it's hard to remember that just a couple of years before, they had been those flappers, those middle-class dancing flappers of the 1920s. Naturally, that created a crisis, and more than an economic crisis. It created sort of a crisis of legitimacy for the American Republic, because all these Americans were looking around, and what they saw was this, that the country had just at the time that there was this new economic system, this new sort of world order had emerged. It was much more complex. There was a lot more going on. And as soon as that happened, the country had its worst economic catastrophe ever. And they thought the two things were connected. And the idea was that perhaps this republic that had been built for a colonial agricultural country in the 18th century, maybe this republic wasn't suited to actually managing a complex modern economy. Maybe that it didn't have the tools it needed and we needed a more modern government to actually deal with these new complex problems. And there was reasons for people to think that because people, they would look across to Europe and what did they see? In Europe, you started to see these new governments, new governing philosophies that had built themselves as more modern and new. Things like fascism and communism. And the states that had adopted these new governments they seem to be doing better in the Depression than the democracies like the United States. In Germany, a new fascist government took over. In Germany as a democracy, it had had one of the worst depressions of any country anywhere. Unemployment had reached nearly 40% there. And when the fascists took over, they got the country very quickly back to full employment. And in the Soviet Union, in Russia, you had a communist government that had promised that everybody would have a job, everybody would have a place to live, everybody would have something to eat. While Americans and in a lot of other industrial democracies, they were suffering. So people came to the conclusion that maybe, maybe the republic itself was broken. Maybe it needed to be changed and America needed a more complex and supervised form of government to deal with this more complex society to get out of this horrible crisis of the Great Depression. The president who had the misfortune to find himself in office when the Depression arrived was, of course, Republican Herbert Hoover. Now, Hoover had barely been in office for a year. He was only elected in 1928 when he'd been handed this crisis to resolve. Now, history has not been very kind to Hoover. He's generally remembered as the guy who fumbled through the Depression, who failed to use the power of his office as president, to do what needed to be done to resolve the crisis that he had arrived on his watch. But that reputation, it's really a little bit unfair. And it draws on some ideological assumptions that aren't really true. 
because you can't cast back the political divisions of our own Republican and Democratic parties onto a guy like Hoover. Because Hoover, he wasn't the first Republican of the modern era. He wasn't the first Republican of the fifth party system. He was the last Republican president of the fourth party system and a progressive. See, Hoover, in fact, had one of the most distinguished backgrounds of any president we've ever elected and seemed like the perfect guy to have at the helm at the time of the Great Depression. He was a Stanford-educated engineer. He had made a fortune in business. He wrote an academic treatise, one that's so valued that it's still in use today. He spoke Mandarin Chinese. He, when trapped in the American embassy during the Boxer Rebellion, he stepped up and took a leadership role, became sort of a quasi-military hero as a civilian. He, during the First World War, he organized a great relief effort uh, on his own initiative to help out refugees in the war. Been a very successful Commerce Secretary. And when Teddy Roosevelt created his own third party, when he walked out of the Republican Party to create the Progressive Party, Hoover was with Teddy. He was part of the hardcore progressive wing of the Republican Party. So Hoover didn't have any ideological reason against using strong state par power to solve problems. Hoover's problem was that he failed to appreciate the severity of the crisis. So you've got to remember that the American economy had been in a cycle of boom and bust basically every couple of decades for almost a century. There was the panic of uh, 1837. There was a panic of 1857. There was the panic of 1873. There was the panic of 1893. And now the panic of 1929. So Hoover, like a lot of people, naturally assumed that the job was just to wait out the crisis and things would right themselves eventually as it always had before. So Hoover tried to use the power of his office to sort of cushion the blow, to try to let people ride it out until the economy naturally corrected itself as it had again and again and again over time. So he did things like he created the Reconstruction Finance Corporation to get the banks making loans again. He uh, raised taxes on the wealthy so the government would have money to use for relief and to shore up tax revenues. He uh, worked with industry and labor leaders to try to, to raise wages, to keep wages high. And in fact, a lot of the things he did were things that FDR, when he took office, would then build on and, and do more of. It was just that Hoover hadn't done enough because he didn't appreciate that something had changed and something was different. He did not appreciate not just that it was an economic crisis, but it was a crisis of legitimacy, that people were losing faith in the American government itself, and that they needed to see from their president enough radical action that he was actually going to try to solve their problems. By the end of Hoover's first term and the election of 1932, Herbert Hoover was probably the most hated man in America, and the Republican Party was hated along with him. The American people were disgusted, and they had had enough. The Democrats, now they had nominated New York Governor Franklin Roosevelt. And when campaigning, Roosevelt had promised everybody that he would give them a new deal. He had taken a phrase that was based on his cousin Teddy Roosevelt's proposal for a square deal. And he had coined this new phrase. And the American people, they elected him in a landslide. Hoover, he actually received a telegram during the campaign that uh, had told him famously that he should vote for Roosevelt to make it unanimous. And that wasn't far from the truth. Hoover, he got 59 electoral votes and he won only six states. It was an absolutely epic collapse for the Republican Party, one it would take decades and decades before it would ever recover. So Franklin Roosevelt was now sworn in as the new president and the crisis is now his to resolve. But here's the thing. When Roosevelt had promised America that he would give them a new deal, he had no idea yet what that new deal would be. It was just a stray phrase that he put in a speech that had inspired the imagination. In fact, his chief campaign issue against Hoover had been spending in deficits. But now he's president and the responsibility is his and he builds a new agenda. He gets a bunch of academics and advisors and policy people. He charges them to come up with whatever radical plans and proposals they can come up with to solve the problem. And it takes the Democratic Party in a brand new direction, creating effectively a new ideology, one that had never existed before, this ideology of New Deal liberalism. And of course, not everybody liked what Roosevelt had done. 
and all of his opponents found themselves pushed into the alternative party, the Republican Party, eventually creating a new ideology itself, this ideology of conservatism, pushing back and opposing New Deal liberalism. And we saw the start of a new political age, one that would last until today. And that story is what we're going to be talking about next. Thanks a lot for watching and make sure you tune into the next episode because we're going to be talking about how Franklin Roosevelt in his New Deal agenda began to create the ideology of liberalism that we still know today. Thank <laughs> you.